The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, good afternoon and welcome to your introduction to the Debt Protection Act 2018 and in particular Part 3 Law Enforcement Processing. Uh, my name is Sean Beresford. I'm a sector consultancy manager with IT Governance. Um, and I'll give you a little bit about my background there, just so you know who is um, taking your call, or sorry, delivering your webinar today. Um, that's my background. So I've got a long standing relationship with the uh, criminal justice system, having served in the British Army and worked for national police units, particularly around criminal records, etc. Uh, that was my forte. So I think that gives me the credentials to. Uh, to be here today talking to you about part three processing. So before we begin um, in proper, uh, can I just point out that um, you got you can make questions or you can write questions anytime you want to um, join the webinar itself. And I'll be happy to answer these at the end. Uh, we should have about 15 minutes at the end of the webinar just to go through those. Um, and obviously I'll ask I'll answer as many as I can uh, from that point of view. Uh, a recording is being made of this particular webinar. Uh, and you'll receive that recording in the next couple of days uh, and also you'll get a copy of the slides that's being used on the webinar as well so hopefully you'll find that of use to you. Um, the content of today's webinar is obviously condensed um, we do do this in a day's training so to deliver it in one hour is going to be hard going but um, hopefully I'll keep your attention throughout the next 45 minutes. So without further ado we shall move on with the first part which is obviously just outlining to you what it is we're we're going to be doing today. Uh, we're going to be talking about or giving you an overview of the Debt Protection Act 2018 and introduce you to part three law enforcement processing and discuss where that sits within the Act itself. And we're going to discuss uh, very few of the, the key definitions. There are lots, as you'll appreciate, but we're just going to see about one or two just to draw your attention to them. And we're going to talk about data processing principles applied under part three, data subject rights under part three, and general obligations of the controller under part three. And then we'll wrap up the session with the sanctions that are available to the Information Commissioner relative to Part 3, but obviously they're contained within Part 6 of the Data Protection Act 2018. First of all, then, we talk about how we get to this position. Um, leading from the European Council, uh, the EU law, so to speak, we talk about directives and regulations. So just to situate you on those, uh, directives, um, more often than not, require enabling legislation in the member state where they're to take effect. So, for instance, we had the data, European Debt Protection Directive of 1995 that originally found its way into UK legislation, uh, the Data Protection Act of 1998. So they require that enabling legislation. Regulations are different. They don't require that enabling legislation. They are, if you like, to be applied in all member states on a given date uh, at a given at a given time, if you like, and uh, the GDPR, the General Debt Protection Regulation, is exactly that, it's a regulation. Having said that, um, we have obviously due to Brexit and because of the um, derogations that we have within the uh, GDPR itself, those occasions when we, UK PLC, can actually um, decide which aspects we're going to apply to that. So, for instance, when we talk about, obviously, information services um, we had some decisions to make then about what age limit of a child that would apply to so we have the uh, the opportunity to create and draft laws and we did uh, in relation to the debt protection act um, requirements we introduced a new debt protection act debt protection act 2018 um, on the 25th of may of last year and that fitted obviously what i was just describing which is we needed to obviously um, give life to the European uh, Debt Protection Directive, um, the Law Enforcement Directive, that is, of 2016, 680, uh, that came into effect on the 6th of May. So it's from that um, uh, Debt Protection Directive that we obviously uh, get the direction, if you like, in relation to how we should be managing uh, information that's being processed for a law enforcement purpose by a competent authority. So if you look very quickly at the um, structure of the Debt Protection Act, um, you will see that it covers, if you like, four different processing regimes. It covers within the scope of the GDPR, it covers outside the scope of the GDPR, and it covers processing by competent authorities for those law enforcement purposes, and also competent, sorry, um, processing by the intelligence services, GCHQ, MI5 and MI6. In the structure of the Act, there are seven parts. Uh, part two relates to the GDPR and general processing. 
part three, law enforcement processing, and part four, the processing that's carried out by the intelligence services. And it is part three processing, obviously, that we're going to concentrate on today. Um, often referred to as simply part three processing. Uh, if we slip, in, slip into that abbreviation, I'm sure you'll be able to follow my meaning. The Act itself, seven parts, is supported by 20 different schedules. Here are the first 10. And for law enforcement purposes, what you need to be aware of is obviously um, uh, Schedule 7, which helps to identify, if you like, uh, what a competent authority is or who is a competent authority. Um, and obviously, um, Schedule 8, which lies down the conditions, if you like, for sensitive processing under Part 3. The other schedules of the Act itself um, covers different areas, and in particular, we are drawn towards um, Schedule 16, which talks about penalties. We'll talk more about those later on. Uh, and obviously, the transitional arrangements and the powers of the Information Commissioner in terms of them, if you like, also um, being able to take action against uh, people who don't follow the requirements of this particular Act. The difficulty that we have in this area for a lot of organisations who are competent authorities is that they need to balance, obviously, what they do under Part 2 with what the requirements are for Part 3. So, for instance, you know, any competent authority, take, for instance, the police force, um, they obviously have to manage their workforce in accordance with Part 2. So all those HR, finance, payroll, that sort of thing um, is, in the, uh, is in the Part 2 processing area, where obviously the stuff that they are processing, the personal data they're processing for a law enforcement purpose is covered by Part 3. And as you'll find as we go through this um, next 40 minutes now, obviously there are differences. And that's the breakdown of part three itself, uh, covers six chapters. Uh, and again, we're going to try and work our way through those, covering some of those as we go. Not all of them, because as I say, time is limited today. And this is really just to give you a general situation around part three. The first thing we identify with is the fact that when we talk part three, we are talking sections, not articles. So for instance, uh, we talk about maybe subject access in relation to Article 15 of the GDPR under Part 2, whereas we would talk about subject access coming under Section 45 of the um, uh, Part 3 processing. So again, we're using that um, uh, English reference, if you like, UK reference to uh, legislation, which is we talk the language of sections, not articles. The other thing to point out is some of the definitions within Part 3 change will be slightly. So we get a different uh, definition of what a controller is. Really, it substitutes the, uh, the first part of the definition found in Article 4 of the GDPR with just a reference to the fact that the that a controller um, is the competent authority. So there's no mention of it being a natural legal person. It is the, um, it is the competent authority itself. And that uh, is mirrored in relation to the definition of a data processor. And when it comes later on to uh, those international data transfers, etc., we do talk the language of um, the country to which you're sending the data having a finding of ad adequacy, meeting the adequacy criteria, if you like. However, the criteria used for part three processing is different to that which is used in chapter five of the GDPR, as are the references to appropriate safeguards. It's the same reference, but obviously um, it means something different within part three. That is a complicated area and, and an area that if you're involved in international data transfers for part three purposes, then you really need to read that legislation separately. Understanding what chapter five said is not good enough when it comes down to processing um, international data transfers under part three. There are lots of other references and definitions um, that we can't and don't have time to cite here. But it's really just to say, you know, you need to read the legislation to understand the differences. There are some new definitions we've mentioned two already, which is that of competent authority. So this, um, this part three applies to competent authorities uh, as listed at Schedule 7, um, processing people's personal data for a law enforcement purpose. And we'll come on to these in a minute and we'll give you more, more clarity, if you like, in relation to what they are. Interesting enough, also within part three, when it comes down to answering data subject um, requests, if you like, so requests, subject access requests, uh, requests for erasure, restriction of processing, rectification, etc. Uh, we actually um, still work to the one month period that you've become used to under GDPR. Um, but obviously, within this legislation or this part of the legislation, it actually defines you know, what the appropriate time period is. And it says it starts on the relevant day. And then it tells you what the relevant day is. So actually, 
you can derive a lot more information around our own legislation than perhaps is covered in the GDPR in this particular area. Do not for one instance think that they're the only changes that are different between part two and part three. There's a lot of more different um, definitions, if you like, and terminology that's used in part three that you won't find within um, GDPR. For instance, we talk about qualified um, uh, decisions, if you like, in relation to automated decision making, qualified significant decisions. Um, it only applies to common authorities, process and personal data for a law enforcement purpose. That's the primary understanding to draw from part three. And it covers all those different um, organisations listed at um, Schedule 7. And again, example there, Food Standards Agency. So from that point of view, then, what is a competent authority? Um, and on some of the slides, you'll see in the top left-hand corner uh, the relevant section number from Part 3 that helps you later on to steer towards you know, reading this through the legislation yourselves and getting a better understanding. So Section 30 says a competent authority is a person, and that person is the legal person, if you like. So it could be the Director General of an organisation, maybe the National Crime Agency, it could be the Chief Constable, etc. Um, so it's that legal person, if you like, from that point of view. So a person specified at Schedule 7 that has statutory functions to exercise public authority or public powers for any of the law enforcement purposes. From that point of view, um, if you look at Schedule 7, and we're not going to go into detail today, um, but it covers 56 separate entries, and that's not 56 separate competent authorities. So, for instance, it would refer to all police forces covered by the Police Act of 1996, of which there are 43. It covers all courts and tribunals, of which there are many and numerous. Um, so, from that point of view, you can see how Schedule 7 actually covers lots more, if you like, competent authorities than perhaps you originally think. But it does cover at the first entry um, all government departments. So if you are a representative of a government department, then obviously from that point of view, if you are having that responsibility, if you like, to exercise public authority or public powers uh, for any of the law enforcement purposes, then you are and will be carrying out part three processing. Just by the way of some examples then, um, MOPAC is the Mayor's Office of Policing and Crime, uh, and I think you can relate to the Police and Crime Commissioners. We all have them in our respective um, areas where we live, etc. So um, they are not listed at Schedule 7, and because um, apart from else, they are not processing information for a law enforcement purpose. It equally does not apply to GCHQ, MI5 and MI6, and the answer to that is obvious. It's because obviously part four applies. So again, part four uniquely um, relates to the processing carried out by the intelligence services, uh, and they are not competent authorities as defined by Schedule 7. Law enforcement purpose here um, is represented in this way. It's the prevention, investigation, detection, or prosecution of criminal offences or the execution of criminal penalties including the safeguarding against and prevention of threats to public security. I'm sure that some people listening on the line might be coming from, um, excuse me, different police forces. And so I take this opportunity just to point out to you that the law enforcement purpose is different from the policing purpose as defined in the management of police information. They are not one and the same. So there's a first point of reference for you in terms of the differences. An example here then um, of this scenario, if you like. So a shopkeeper who has CCTV cameras installed on their premises um, does so for the detection and prevention of crime. If they then report a crime to the police, and obviously that crime was captured on the CCTV images, um, maybe somebody doing shoplifting or something of that nature, and then the police turn up to investigate the alleged crime and they're shown the CCTV imagery and they take it for evidential purposes at that point it becomes a personal data that's being processed for a law enforcement purpose by a competent authority, therefore is subject to part three processing. The shopkeeper is processing under part two. Uh, they are not a competent authority. And obviously like so many other private companies and other organizations, if you like, um, use of CCTV cameras on their premises, if you like, is covered by the GDPR uh, and should be operated under direction and the guidance issued by the Information Commissioner. There is a code of practice issued in that area for that purpose. 
Um, Article 5, data processing principles. Um, no, you haven't come into the wrong uh, webinar now. I've related this to Article 5 because the six data processing principles defined under Article 5, and I'll put these up very quickly on the screen, okay? Um, the first one is obviously that, uh, that the personal data is processed lawfully, fair, and transparently. Um, it's collected for a limited purpose, if you like, purpose limitation. Um, you only take the amount of data you need, so data minimization principle. Uh, that information, whilst you have that information, should be accurate and up-to-date. Uh, it should only be retained for as long as you've got a purpose for doing so, storage limitation uh, principle. And the final one is obviously the data should be processed in an appropriate manner to maintain security, otherwise referred to the, as the integrity and confidentiality principle. Uh, putting all those together and applying those makes the data controller accountable. So within the GDPR itself, it talks about obviously the pseudo principle of accountability. But how does this relate then into part three? Uh, well, quite clearly, um, part three does cover it in terms of processing. Um, it's covered by those sections that we mentioned. So uh, 35 to 40 in this instance covers the processing um, relative to the data processing principles. Um, the first one, principle one, you will note obviously the uh, the lettering, if you like, changed from uh, white to black to make a point. And the point is, is that under um, section 35, there is not the requirement, if you like, to be so transparent um, as would otherwise be defined under Article 5. That doesn't mean that you don't have to be transparent when you're processing uh, people's personal data for law enforcement purposes. It just means that it's not covered within uh, the first principle, if you like, covered by section 35. And it's covered later on under section 44, but in terms of uh, differentiating between the principles applied to part two and the principles applied to part three, uh, that's what you're looking at. When it comes down to lawful basis, remember principle one, lawful fair, uh, you need obviously to decide what your lawful basis is. Um, clearly it's okay to be taking somebody's uh, personal data and processing it with their consent. So at the entry level, um, just processing information based on consent is okay. Or Obviously, the collection and processing of that data is necessary for the performance of the task carried out for that purpose by a common authority. In other words, obviously, the um, law enforcement purpose from that point of view. So consent, or you're doing it for the other reason, uh, necessary for the performance of a task, that makes it lawful in the first pass of um, uh, meeting the principle one requirements under section 35. Um, in Article uh, 9 of the GDPR, uh, we were introduced, obviously, to what is called special categories of personal data. Uh, within the um, Section 35 of the Part 3 uh, processing part of the Debt Protection Act, um, it does not specifically mention um, special categories of data. What it says is that if you are processing any of the data sets um, described and shown on the screen there, then you are conducting sensitive processing. And then it goes on, obviously, to talk about what you must be doing if you are conducting sensitive processing. So what's your lawful basis if you're doing that under Section 35? Well, again, we go back into do you have the consent of the individual to process their data, their, if you like, sensitive data in that regard. And it says that, obviously, if you get consent, you must also, at the time when the processing is carried out, have an appropriate policy in place. That's a legal requirement now specified under section 35. So if you're doing that, you must have a policy. And the policy must be in effect from the point when the process begins, and the policy must be maintained until a period uh, of six months after the um, processing has ceased. Whether you keep the policy longer is a matter for you, but um, legislation-wise, you are required to have it in place at the start of the processing, and obviously, um, to, uh, to maintain it for a period of six months after the processing has ended. Of course, given the nature of what um, people involved in this area are engaged in, you won't be getting always the consent, if at all, from the people that are part of um, or come to your interest, should we say. And bear in mind that we're not talking here about all wrongings. Um, at the end of the day, people are able to use having their data processed for law enforcement purposes. Could be perpetrators, but equally could be victims and witnesses and aggrieved parties, etc. So again, it's all part of that law enforcement purpose. But you must obviously have the appropriate policies in place uh, in that regard. But um, 
more often than not, you will be processing without that individual's consent, because obviously you are deploying consent as a basis for lawful process in this regard isn't going to work for you. All the individual will have to do is refuse consent and you couldn't process their data, which isn't going to work. So what you need to look at, obviously, if you're collecting any of that sensitive data, the one on the previous slide that equates to um, special categories of data as defined by Article 9, then without consent, the processing must be strictly necessary for a law enforcement purpose. And there is currently some debate in relation to this change of emphasis, if you like. It goes from being necessary for a law enforcement purpose to being strictly necessary. And people are obviously looking to find a greater, a more precise definition of what strictly means. Um, it must also be that the processing you are going to undertake meets a meets at least one of the conditions in Schedule 8 of the Tech Act 2018. And again, at the time when the processing is carried out, the controller has an appropriate policy document in place. Again, it's another legal requirement. If you're doing sensitive processing without consent, you must have a appropriate, uh, or an appropriate policy document in place. Having worked with the police in this area over recent months, delivering training, um, I can tell you that several of those police forces have identified at least uh, anywhere between 650 and 900 processes that they conduct for which they've had to go through this process and identify their lawful basis and then come up where necessary with po policies covering what they're doing in that particular area. Um, if you're not doing that, if you haven't done that already, then already you could be seen as being infringement of the relevant sections within part three. Mentioned obviously that requirement for meeting a Schedule 8 condition. Um, there are nine of them listed within the schedule. You need to identify obviously for each one of your uh, processing activities, which, and, you're, and if you're doing sensitive processing, which of these Schedule 8 conditions is gonna to apply to you. Possibly if you're um, somebody like the police that obviously you're gonna fall behind your statutory et cetera purposes and, or the administration of justice, remember it, it must be at least one, could be more. So that you need to go to this process and obviously ask the question, well, which Schedule 8 condition am I applying? Because if you are getting investigated by the Information Commissioner for any reason, um, that's one of the questions obviously the ICO will be asking you. You are conducting sensitive processing, uh, therefore under which condition of Schedule 8 are you relying on? Section 36 deals with purpose limitation, which otherwise is known obviously as Principle 2. And it says that the law enforcement purpose for which the personal data is collected on any occasion must be specified, explicit and legitimate. It also goes on to say that personal data so collected must not be processed in a manner that is incompatible with the purposes for which it was collected. And this is causing a lot of um, angst amongst certain law enforcement bodies, if you like, uh, because obviously they do take their information for one purpose. And then over time, over many, many years, other people have come up with a reason why um, it would be uh, appropriate for them to be sharing that information, if you like. Uh, maybe it would do with sharing police information, for instance, for the purposes of cell allocation when somebody goes to prison. Okay, so at the end of the day, um, is seeing where you fit in in relation to that and managing the step down between the information that's collected and processed under part three with the sharing with a non-competent authority um, for something that is a not a law enforcement purpose. Example here of obviously defining the actual purpose and purpose limitation is the fact that the police uh, conduct the investigation of criminal offences and they share that information with the CPS who prosecute it. So the fine line there, if you like, is in relation to the police collect for investigation purposes and obviously the CPS process for prosecution purposes. So again, it's forcing you down this road of being quite clear in terms of the purpose limitation. Why do I have this personal data under part three and what am I doing with it? Section 37, um, missing from this particular presentation, but just to make the point, um, it's about data minimization. Data minimization is data minimization, and therefore, from that point of view, um, even as a um, competent authority processing uh, people's personal data for a law enforcement purpose, you should only aim to take the information you require to, if you like, service that purpose, to achieve that purpose. Taking more information than you need is not, if you like, something that 
um, would be viewed um, as appropriate under the circumstances. Taking too much information, you, you can't claim it as intelligence, if you like. If you didn't have a purpose to actually claim the information and record the information, um, then obviously um, you should not be recording it. Data minimization principle applies. Uh, moving on to section 38, and this is where a lot of the change occurs in relation to the difference in principles. Um, so first of all, it says in there at section 38 that um, the competent authority must differentiate between uh, personal data that's based on facts versus that which is obviously based on assessment. And use the example here um, in relation to the police national computer, uh, which is obviously where arrests and criminal convictions are recorded, etc., cetera, um, with information generated by the police and provided by the courts. And to information that's stored on the police national database, the PND, two separate systems, which is a um, police intelligence database where people are making, if you like, uh, assessments on the intelligence that they have um, uh, drawn together, if you like, from different sources, um, validating that information and giving it an assessment, if you like, in terms of uh, how useful it is uh, and how reliable it is. So again, it's now built into our own legislation that you must be doing this. You must differentiate between fact and assessment. Section 38 also says that obviously you should be looking to categorize your data subjects. And it suggests that you use obviously these sorts of headings, if you like, um, people shown as victims, witnesses, suspects, or convicted people. Um, it is not mandated. You're not mandated to use those four specific titles. There may be other ones that you, um, that you would choose to use instead. But make no mistake, what section 38 says is that you must categorize the data subjects that you're dealing with. Call them what you want, but obviously you must follow obviously what it says in section 38 about categorization of data subjects. Section 39 um, talks about um, storage limitation, otherwise principle five, and it says that uh, information should be kept for no longer than is necessary. Again, using that rough example there, giving you an end date of March 2020. Those appropriate time limits must be established for periodic review. So if you are an organization other than and the police, then you will probably not be working to any form of retention schedule as it currently is. The police um, work to what they call MOPI, uh, which groups information under group one, two, three, four. Uh, and obviously those groups determine with some other factors how long you would hold information for or should hold information for. So from that point of view, um, if you haven't already got a retention schedule in place uh, and that retention schedule has a periodic reviews attached to them, uh, then obviously, again, this is an area that you should need to give some attention to and come up with your retention policies accordingly. Throughout, obviously, GDPR and now part three, there are constant references to how long you hold data for and obviously giving assurances that you'll get rid of the data when it's no longer required for the original purpose, subject to exceptions. So in other words, you know, having a retention schedule in place will be something the ICO will be looking for in that regard, should you ever get quizzed in this area, how long do you keep people's personal data for? Um, in relation to other areas then, uh, moving on to now the um, rights of data subjects. Um, the correlation here, if you like, uh, is, is back into the GDPR. So we see the sections down the left-hand side of the screen talking about the relevant sections in part three. And obviously we map those across obviously to the relevant sections within the GDPR. Um, straight away, when we talk about the articles uh, and the right to be informed, um, we see that section, oh, sorry, Article 14 is missing. There's no requirement under Part 3 processing to make somebody aware when you've got their information from somebody other than the data subject, or you've got it from a publicly accessible source, i.e. the internet. You do not have to do that under Part 3 processing. But you are still required, obviously, to give some basic information to the individual in relation to who you are, uh, why you're processing their data, and give them some limited information as defined in section 44 as to why uh, you are doing that. And obviously, the other things that you would pick out from um, uh, Article 13, which is obviously who the controller is and what rights they have in relation to making complaints, etc. When it comes down to subject access, that's obviously maps across to Article 15 of the GDPR. Uh, and obviously, the other one shown in the slide shows other mapping as well. 
Interesting point is the fact that section 47 combines both erasure and restriction of processing, otherwise two articles in the GDPR, into the one section. It covers both in one section. Um, the other section shown there gives you more information around the supplementary arrangement of some of this stuff. Uh, and also it talks about the right not to be subject to automated decision making. Law enforcement itself is moving on and obviously um, the police and other law enforcement agencies are becoming more tech savvy and they're using obviously artificial intelligence in some instances to try uh, and obviously help them solve crime. But obviously there are rules that govern the use of those systems that um, are covered by part three and those rules must be followed by the police in those areas. Uh, we, there is an ongoing court case at the moment with South Wales to do with the use of facial recognition systems um, in the general populace. So uh, again, you know, not the specific target of people coming through border controls, but just generally people in the high street, etc. Do they match, you know, the facial images of wanted people and so on and so forth? So, you know, that sort of use of technology by the police and other law enforcement agencies uh, will come under the Part Three processing and. Uh, and therefore, there are um, rules, if you like, that must be followed and applied and safeguards that must be um, put into those sort of processes, if you like. And they're covered by sections 49 and uh, uh, section 50. Information must be provided data subjects um, is not as detailed as it is under part, um, sorry, under articles 13, 13, 1 and 13, 2 of the GDPR. Like we said, you don't have to be so transparent, but you still, if you are a Competent authority processing for law enforcement purposes. You still need, obviously, to um, uh, to give a um, an amount of information to the data subjects when they first come to your attention, uh, with the the, the um, with the uh, approach that uh, at some point, um, as they you get further into your investigation um, and you begin to identify what category they are, are, you, are they a victim, a witness, are they a suspect? then obviously then you can give them further information uh, to, that tells them what you intend to do with the data you've collected from them. So for instance, you know, victims may be told something different to a suspect. Victims may be told, obviously, you're going to share their information with victim support. And therefore, that's only right and proper then that you're being transparent in that area. So again, the idea is, is that obviously you uh, provide um, information to the data subjects relative, relative to the role in which they play within your investigative scenario. Um, the key night amongst you would have realised that obviously there is no right, right of data portability, um, otherwise Article 20, and there's no right to object to the processing of personal data, otherwise it's obviously Article 21. So you don't get the full range of rights that you would get otherwise under GDPR. So again, it's making these points as we go through this webinar, um, that obviously you can't just take GDPR and apply it to what you're doing. There are changes, there are nuances that you must consider, um, because obviously sometimes that will be right and proper in your favour. If you wrongly believe that individuals have a right, obviously, to object to your processing, and you haven't read the legislation, you will not know that that's not a right that they have. They cannot object to you processing their data in that regard. They can object in the sense that, um, they can ask you to erase the information or they can put you under restriction of processing, but they cannot object in that regard um, as otherwise defined under Article 21. Subject active rights and the rights of rectification, erasure and restriction do not apply to the processing of relevant personal data. And relevant personal data is defined within Part 3, um, as shown on the thumbnail. Uh, really here we're talking about information perhaps that um, and records, if you like, notes that the trial judge has made during the course of the trial, they will not be subject to data subject rights. In other words, they won't be made accessible to a data subject uh, in response to a such access request. They won't be subject to erasure, um, all those sorts of things. So again, um, it's a new reference, if you like, new, if you want to call it a definition. We have a definition of relevant personal data. Um, and so there is a whole abundance of these scattered through the uh, part three that you really do need to um, understand and uh, ensure that you have knowledge of. Uh, when we run the course, uh, we actually give you a handout where we've condensed these um, terminology, expressions, et cetera, and new definitions. And from memory, I think about four pages worth you get um, that actually helps you to relate to and identify you know, with these new terms and expressions.
it's not all one-way traffic um, uh, when it comes down to data subject rights. At the end of the day, um, it's a bit like GDPR, people can make applications, they can obviously make a request to have their information deleted um, under the right to, to be forgotten, the right of erasure, etc. Um, and they can obviously apply um, for subject access, etc. But the police and other law enforcement agencies, when it comes down to it, um, can apply restrictions to uh, dealing with that request. They can respond either wholly or partly. Um, and obviously what their restrictions would relate to is the fact that the release of that information or the deletion of that information would obstruct an ongoing inquiry, would prejudice an ongoing inquiry, would have an adverse impact on public security um, or national security, or it would involve the disclosure of information about other people and affect their rights and freedoms. So again, um, it's making sure that you understand, A, that there is a differential. You're talking about, obviously, such access, for instance, under Section 45 and not Article 15. And even then, you've got some very specific restrictions that you can call upon in terms of restricting the information you give to the individual. Applying restrictions wholly or partly must be notified to the subject. That's a difficult one. You're not going to tell them, obviously, that um, uh, I'm not releasing this information because it would prejudice the ongoing inquiry. They may not be even aware that they are subject to an ongoing inquiry. So again, that needs to be handled uh, in a particular way. But there is no need to notify if doing so would undermine the purpose of the restriction. Again, you can't just ignore the request, though. You've got to find a way through this in order to give a response to the individual to the lawful request that they made. Don't forget that these are data subject rights. They have a right of access. They have a right of rectification and erasure, et cetera. And therefore, you've got to be seen to be engaging with the individuals to responding to their requests um, and obviously answering them um, within the constraints that you're working under by not giving them too much information, but facilitating a response to them. Uh, if the personal data must be maintained for a purpose of evidence, so for instance, maybe you've got a right, uh, sorry, uh, an individual has made a request to have their information deleted. Um, then from that point of view, uh, you can choose not to delete it, right to ratio, but obviously you would then be required under this legislation um, to um, apply a restriction of processing to that information. Uh, and again, this reference then to the final bullet point there, a controller may not take a significant decision. And again, that's a new, uh, has a definition, if you like, within the meaning of part three. Um, as does the next one, which is a qualified significant decision in the same area when it comes down to automated processing uh, in that regard. So again, new definitions and expressions to get your head around. My the next subject, the next subject can be contacted to verify identity. That is always, always the case. You should never obviously be dealing with individuals if you haven't identified who they are in the first instance, or even talking to them about the uh, the content, if you like, of a record or something that you've created in respect to them. Until such time as you have uh, uh, verified their identity, then obviously uh, that's a conversation you shouldn't be having. No charges can be applied, a bit like GDPR. You know, the up to £10 charge has been done away with from that point of view. Um, there are, are opportunities, if you like, to apply a reasonable administrative fee. Um, but that is subject to regulations and they've not been issued yet. A uh, response period cannot be extended uh, in terms of uh, uh, the two month extension that otherwise a data controller can claim under part two, i.e. a subject access request, for instance, under article um, 15. You will know obviously that if you get a subject access request, you can, it provide you respond to the individual within the first month, tell them that um, you're applying a two-month extension to the period you're, you're claiming to respond to their request. There is no such um, extension period attached to uh, the processing of subject access rights under part three. Uh, in real terms, one month means one month. This is a bit controversial. Um, it is being looked at and there's a suggestion that um, maybe the legislators will change this position later on, but for the here and now, a competent authority cannot claim an extension and they must therefore look to respond to a data subject in response to their subject access um, rights uh, within one month. And again, that's that reference there to facilitating the exercise of their rights. Um, information may be provided in any form, including electronically. So again, if you get the request coming into you, maybe subject access electronically, 
you can respond electronically and the information be provided in the same as request. So you, if it comes manually, you can send it back by the post, obviously caveat supply in terms of security. If you get it electronically, you can respond through uh, electronic means. Uh, mapping the general obligations across, again, sections down the left hand side, relevant articles on the, the, uh, the right hand side of your screens. Um, you can see that pretty much they're all still covered. Um, they map across quite nicely, section 56, article 24, we've still got the requirement to have um, data protection by design and by default, um, section 57 versus article 25 if you like. Still need to have agreements in place when it comes to joint data controllers, um, rules around processes, otherwise article 28 in terms of those conditions that must be written into contracts, et cetera, et cetera. But there are one or two um, new ones in there. So for instance, we'll talk about section 62 and section 63. Um, there is a requirement under part three to introduce logging. Um, before we get into logging proper, just to cover off a few at the top there, um, when we talk about records of processing activities uh, that we are required under part three, uh, the subtle difference between those at, uh, at part three and those described under article 30 is that for the purposes of part three, you must also include the legal basis for your processing. So you still need to do a record of processing activity, but you must also include the legal basis. Records made available must, must be made available to the Commission on request, so that's a lawful requirement now. If the Information Commissioner asks you for that record of process and activity, you must provide it. Then it goes on to say, obviously, that there is the requirement now for you to maintain logs. And it gives an example of six there and explains why those logs are important and necessary. Interestingly enough, at section 62, it just gives more detail around two of those specific log types a consultation log and disclosure log. So again, a um, bit more detail, and this is what you should be aiming for in the future. Um, remember that the Information Commission can ask you for these logs, and therefore this is their way of actually holding you to account. So who looked at these records um, to do with law enforcement, etc., and who did you share the information with, um, and why, basically? Uh, what was the identity of the recipient, and what was your justification for um, disclosing it? There is an exemption you can find to this currently at Schedule 20, Part 4, Section 14, which says that if your automated processing systems which were set up before the 6th of May 2016, you do not have to obviously um, apply these logging rules. Um, and this exemption remains in effect until the 6th of May 2023. So if you're looking to bring in new systems in the future, you've got to make sure, almost like debt protection by design and by default, that obviously you include this requirement, the requirement to be able to log um, those six logging types, if you like, on those new systems. So the requirement for data controllers, um, i.e. Um, competent authorities, uh, to uh, complete, if you like, undertake data detection impact assessments. So uh, what we're representing there is the nine-step approach that the ICO has put on their guidance, if you like, in relation to doing DPIAs. But but uh, interestingly enough, in the guidance itself, there is no reference to necessity and proportionality. Um, the other requirement in this area is the fact that you must include safeguards. Safeguards are defined within part three, but part of your DPI process is actually to list those safeguards and record what they are. Personal data breaches, you'll be familiar with this in terms of the process. Um, when a data controller becomes aware, either because it occurred in their watch or they're told by a data processor, they obviously must report to the Information Commissioner uh, within a period of 72 hours unless um, it's unlikely the data breach or whatever is unlikely to result in a risk to data, data subject. And obviously they may also, must also um, tell the data subject if the risk that's been identified uh, is a high risk. So again, you need to tell them without any undue delay. What's the subtle difference in section 66 in relation to part three processing? It's the fact that you must tell a controller in another member state, okay, about your data breach, because obviously it could have an adverse impact um, on an ongoing operation. It could jeopardize the life of an undercover officer or whatever it might be. So again, there is a requirement in there to tell anybody in another member state that who's uh, who you shared the information with so that they can make their own determinations about what it means to them. Debt protection officers 
Tell by section 69, uh, pretty much the same as we've got within, obviously, GDPR part two, um, covered by articles 37, if you like. Um, the thing to note there, apart from anything else, is obviously that your DPO shouldn't just be somebody that you point the finger at um, and say, it's you, a bit like the lottery. Uh, at the end of the day, the person you appoint as a DPO must have expert knowledge of data protection law and practice. They meet that requirement, and again, that's a difficult thing because it doesn't actually tell you how to define expert knowledge and, or indeed experience. Um, but it does encourage you, obviously, to look to put in place the right person in the first instance. Data controller, uh, sorry, data protection officer can work for several different organisations. Um, I've seen that and experienced that now uh, a number of different times in government departments, and in particular with the collaboration that goes off between police forces now. Uh, they share a DPO, and obviously within the task specified in section 71, uh, everything you see in front of you now is what a data, data protection officer is required to do. That will not be unfamiliar to you because that's exactly what's defined, if you like, um, within the actual constraints of uh, Article 39 of the GDPR. What is different, obviously, for Part 3 is that the data protection officer has further responsibilities, as identified on this slide. They are, if you like, required to assign responsibilities, to raise awareness around, obviously, part three processing, training staff, and conducting audits. So if you are a DPO and you're involved in this world, do look at section 71 and see the additional tasks that fall to you. Um, transfers to third countries and international organizations. This is a complex area. It is covered by part three. Um, and from that perspective, um, we're not you'll be pleased to know, going to go into too much detail. But basically, if you're looking to make the uh, transfer to a relevant authority or international organization, there are three conditions that apply. If you're going to transfer the data to a person who's not a relevant authority in a third country or international organization, a further, further four conditions, giving you a total of seven, must be applied. And obviously, there are restrictions in terms of the onward transmission of that information um, and in particular, in relation to transfers to um, a person who is not a relevant authority or an international organisation, you must tell the ICO that that's what you've done. The ICO, so we're moving out of part three now into, if you like, um, part six, which is the area within the Act that deals with enforcement actions. So the Information Commissioner can, for infringements, if you like, um, of the Part three, issue enforcement notices, assessment notices, or enforcement notices, in other words, directing you to do something you haven't done, or they can issue you with a penalty. And the penalties are exactly the same as they are um, for the rest of the infringements under the GDPR. In other words, you know, those really big fines. Section 156 of part six talks about the higher maximum fine, talks about obviously how it's 20 million or 4% of last year's global and global annual worldwide turnover, which is a significant amount of money. But of course, um, most public, uh, most common authorities being public bodies uh, will only ever um, get to the 20 million stage if that, um, the 4% fine doesn't apply. It says under the legislation that uh, it's for these uh, infringements, if you like, or infringements against these sections that you will get the higher maximum fine. So again, I'll let you very quickly cast your eyes over those. A lot of them to do with uh, breaches of the principles and failure to facilitate the rights of data subjects and those international data transfers. And then there is the standard and maximum fine, which is 10 million or 2%. And from that point of view, um, it doesn't apply to public authorities. And this would apply to infringements of these, if you like, sections uh, within the actual legislation itself. So not following the requirements around debt protection by design and by default, not um, applying logging and not maintaining records of processing activities, doing debt protection impact assessments um, and obviously reporting data breaches. These are the standard maximum fine uh, of up to um, 10 million euros. I think that works out to about 18.8 million pounds and the actual higher maximum currently works out to about 17.7 million pounds. Uh, in terms of um, where we are with this, um, what we show on this slide, uh, and it's not picking on the police, uh, but between 2016 and 2018, these police forces here 
receive fines of this magnitude, if you like, under the old regime, where the higher maximum amount was £500,000. Um, you can find this information, it's publicly available. Just go and look on the Information Commission's website under the What Have We Done tab, and you can obviously then apply filters to come down and find all the infringements by different competent authorities, in this case, the police. But it's not the only ones. The uh, Crown Prosecution Service received a fine of £325,000. And although not shown on the slide, the uh, independent inquiry into child sexual abuse recently received a fine of £200,000. Again, this is public available information, uh, and you can find it on the Information Commission website. Under the old rules, we had something called an undertaking. And again, various police forces appeared on that list as well, where obviously the infringement of the legislation wasn't that severe, um, and each police force obviously was required to give an undertaking to do better in the future. So again, even if you are the people that are supposed to enforce the law, you are subject to the same law, and obviously you could find yourself receiving much bigger fines uh, in the future. The Information Commissioner he has published information in relation to uh, this area of business, if you like, part three processing. There is a handout that you can find, a little um, poster, if you like, that you can download from the Information Commission's website. It covers 12 steps that you should be looking at to prepare yourself for managing people's personal data in this way. Um, I would recommend, obviously, in the absence of anything internal you want to do, that you download these and obviously you put them on notice boards if you are a competent authority and you want to draw attention to part three processing. So that brings us to the conclusion of the webinar per se. Um, we have obviously got courses to offer in this area, um, a whole day's course on law enforcement processing where we cover everything we've just run through and a lot more and in a lot more detail. And we also run uh, training courses on uh, the data protection itself. Other, other acts and things we do and other um, GDPR type training, not gonna dwell on this because I'm sure you wanna get to the questions um, and obviously if you follow this link when this comes through to you and you were interested in booking a course, we do public courses and we do in-house training. Um, me, primarily, will come to your organisation and deliver a day's training for you um, to a selective audience. And if that's what you want, then obviously click the link and speak to our people and we will obviously look to arrange that training for you. Um, outside of that then, we've come to the questions. So I now need just to go across, obviously, to the questions that have been asked while we've been on air. And not many questions. I'm getting off lightly here by the looks of it. Um, is there a copy of the slides we can download? Uh, the answer is they will be coming out to you in the next couple of days together with a recording. Uh, will we get a certificate of attendance? Uh, I'm not sure about a webinar. You do on the course. Um, it carries, uh, carries CPD points as well. Um, but I'm sure that uh, my colleague will be able to uh, confirm that for you. Uh, and certification, uh, same sort of thing. Um, the one day training course is not a certified course at the moment. Our GDPR courses are, um, but we haven't gone to the stage of certifying this particular course at the moment. Okay, um, reading obviously other people's responses. Uh, not many questions here, so if anybody's got any questions, then I'm happy to field those for the time being. And apart from that, that probably is bringing us close to the conclusion of the webinar. Any final questions then before we wrap this up? Hopefully you found it useful. Um, hopefully, obviously, this is... Um, put you on the path, if you like, in terms of understanding what you should be doing around part three processing, particularly if you are a competent authority. Um, this is UK legislation, you should be following it, and obviously we can help you with training in that regard. Um, so in the absence of any further questions, uh, I think we shall draw stunts here and bring the webinar to a close. Thank you for your attendance. I'm happy to receive any other feedback you may have, uh, and obviously any questions you've got in relation to this subject, and do feed them back to us and we will endeavour to get back to you with an answer. Okay, no more questions. A few thank yous coming in. I appreciate that. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I do hope this has been helpful for you. Um, and if you want any more, as I say, contact my colleagues. But apart from that, we shall draw this to a close.
Thank you very much for listening.